What am I reading? It's a zine. Uh, independent magazine, usually as simple as some photocopied pages stapled together in the middle. It's a great way to challenge traditional publications, bring up ideas that aren't typically found in the mainstream media, and just make art, however structured or unstructured you want it to be. Underground publishers and individuals make zines for a variety of reasons. Some want a space for voices that they never see in books and other magazines. Others just want a place where they can publish their diary, their day in a life as an artist. And some have shaped huge religious and political ideologies since Gutenberg invented the printing press some 500 or so years ago. Let's talk about the history of zines, shall we? Depending on how you define them, zines have been around for quite a while. Cornell University marks the start of zine making at 1517 with Martin Luther's 95 Theses. Specific, self-made, and self-published, this zine nailed to the door sparked the Protestant Reformation that would forever transform Christianity and how Christians interact with and interpret the Bible. This start of self-publication begins with a force of public expression for change from an individual, something that would time and again impact history moving towards the modern age. The Enlightenment and higher common literacy levels saw the political broadsides and pamphlets pushing a strange colonist slowly towards the American Revolution of the 1770s. Thomas Paine's brief common sense held together with just a few folded sheets of paper spread powerful plain language about the transition of governments. Quotes like, society is produced by our wants and government by wickedness. The former promotes our happiness positively by uniting our affections, the latter negatively by restraining our vices. In the 20th century, zines mixed social commentary with art and began to form alternative communities for their voices. The poets and artists of the Surrealist movement of the 1920s simultaneously accepted and rejected social interpretation of their work. Publishing Dada pieces seemingly devoid of meaning. At the same time, the sharing of ideas with zines created more intense local collaborations and an embrace of collectively made art as legitimate. The Great Migration led to a major demographic shift of Black Americans to Northern cities, creating the environment for the explosion of the Harlem Renaissance. Much like the Surrealist artists of the Harlem Renaissance use zines to share works not accepted at traditional publications and carve a space for minority voices. The controversial publication Fire was produced by white author and patron Carl Van Vetten in 1926. Along with Zora Neale Hurston, the magazine covered writers like Langston Hughes and Aaron Douglas to encourage interest in their lifestyle and their work in Harlem. Though this did draw eyes and more support, the way the scene was depicted led to criticism by others, including W.E.B. Dubois. Moving into the 1930s and 40s, fans, rather than artists or creators, picked up the pen and typewriter to share their passions. Book Riot's History of Zines cites The Comet from May 1930 as the first American fanzine created by the Science Correspondence Club to talk about science and science fiction. In 1949, the Xerox machine is born, and this puts a powerful tool into the hands of public opinion. For the first time, fans have a way to directly express their feelings back at the people whose media they are enjoying. So by the 1950s and 60s, zines become easier and much nicer to produce. Bands are using them to stir up word about their shows. Music journalism is blooming before Rolling Stone is even thought of. And a bunch of madmen take comics to the next level. R. Crumb and Art Spiegelman took inspiration from Mad and Cracked Humor magazines and wanted to create their own with a style and topics that the newsstand wouldn't touch. 
Science fiction fanzines also found a fervent audience, especially when Star Trek first hit television screens. The 1967 fanzine Spockanalia was the first official Star Trek fanzine, and it pulled together the first of one of the biggest pop culture movements that still exists today, Trekkies. The fan poll was so strong that lobbying organized through these zines actually brought the show back from its initial cancellation after two seasons in 1968. As pop culture decided the flow of American publications, dissent was ruling across the pond in the UK. The punk scene grew around colleges and shows of bands like the Sex Pistols and The Clash, and they developed their own homebrew journalism. Some of the most popular zines, like Sniffing Glue, were started by teenagers on leased Xerox machines in the hopes that they would be able to pay the bill by the time it came. The countercultural distaste for how punk music was portrayed in the media further encouraged people to go underground with how they publicize new artists and acts. This underground road traveled from the 1970s all the way to the 1990s, with maximum rock and roll in America becoming the manual for hardcore music and its scene. The Riot Girl movement was inspired by this punk ethos and the rise of third wave feminism, really seeking to raise public consciousness of the sexist boundaries of society. Riot Girl Press was founded by Erica Reinstein and Mary Summer to quote, express themselves and reach large audiences without having to rely on the mainstream media. Bands like Bikini Kill popularized the movement, which continued and expanded online. Many zinesters starting out in punk and riot girl spaces also moved to create other movements for queer voices and inclusivity in feminism. The POC Zine Project, for example, started in 2015, archived zines written by people of color online. Today, zines can be found in so many places. Other than getting involved with zine projects and workshops, if you want to make your own, you can find them at bookstores, record stores, symposiums, concerts, festivals, fairs, and especially zine distros, which primarily work through either mail order or direct contact with zine authors. Microcosm Publishing, AK Press, and other independent publishers carry a rotating variety of zines, and they are always looking for new material. Zine authors may also self-publish through storefronts like Etsy or Shopify and use Instagram to get eyes on their process and their final products. One of my favorite zinesters that I found through Instagram is Braddy Bree. She makes these cute zines. I love all of her designs. They often come with things like stickers and little surprises. And I really love her Nicolas Cage fold-out zines. They have little scenes from his movies inside and they're such a cool experience to see her open them. So here are a few great starting resources. The first one is a zine itself. This is DIY Zines and Comics by Fly. So this zine gives really practical tips on story ideas, scripting, thumbnailing, whether you are going more image-based or more text-based. Another more comprehensive resource is Make a Zine by Joel Beale with Bill Brent. This book from Microcosm Publishing has been out for over 20 years and it really provides a solid background on zines along with many recommendations for further reading. Beale and Brent go really further into the assembly process and give you lots of options for things like block printing, distribution, and more to really take your zine as far as you want it to go. Thanks for watching A Beginner's Guide to Zines. Stay tuned if you'd like more info on how to store zines, some of my favorite zines, and maybe how to make your own, as long as you make it magical. I'll see you in the next video. Thank <laughs> you.